Okay. Hi, everyone. Do we know if we're still waiting for people? Are we still waiting? Okay, maybe I'll give it like two more minutes. But um, in the meantime, Marimba is distributing our zine. Um, if you want to have a look so long. It's basically like a... It's, um, I mean, it was quite tough. We were given like maybe 3,000 words each to condense all of the research that we've done this year. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's brief extracts and reinterpretations of, the, of our research articles, essentially, with um, some additional sort of archival imagery and other things like that. All right, I think I'm going to begin. Um, how does this thing work? Go back. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Monique. Uh, and today I'm going to be chatting to you about my research article, which was titled, as you can read, Archive Utility Location Tracing Practices of Constituency at Zeitz Mocker. So that term, constituency, is one you will hear me referencing throughout the whole talk. Um, and it's based on this publication that I came across back in 2018. You can see it's had a quite a life of its own. Um, it's called the Constituent Museum, and I will read an extract or two for you from there. Um, but essentially, um, what I want to speak about today, uh, so you'll see in the zine that um, I have a, a, a piece titled Archive, um, which was essentially my first chapter. So Archive, Tracing Practices of Archive, um, and Zeitz Maka. Um, and then my second chapter looked at uh, the usefulness of museums, and for that I looked at the Center for Art Education as sort of a, a gateway into um, interrogating that. And so for today, um, I'm going to talk about location, and it was quite interesting to hear the discussion about Cape Town just now, um, because that is essentially what um, my presentation will be about or if not Cape Town, the, the arts ecologies of Cape Town. So I was quite curious about, like I mentioned um, in our first conversation, like really doing practice-based research and what it means to sort of have this very rigorous methodology and academic methodology, but take it into practice. Um, and so I did it in sort of a retro perspective way, where I um, had a look at some of the past projects that Zeitzmocker have done. So to begin with, I'd just like to give you a brief breakdown of what constituency actually means. Um, so essentially, it's a methodology focused on placing relationships at the center of any operation. Um, and there are four tenets or guidelines which um, form the basis of this. And those are reciprocity, activation, structures, and negotiation. So the next few minutes might be a bit laborious, but I do feel like it's necessary. I'm going to read from the Constituent Museum exactly what each of these um, tenets encompasses, after which I'll get into my case studies. OK, bear with me. So <laughs> reciprocity indicates a range of, oh, I should probably do this. Here we go, okay. Reciprocity indicates a range of constituent activities based upon the act of exchange. So again, with my title being transaction, this is specifically what I was thinking about. Whereby the act of exchange is not necessarily financial or undertaken as a means to ensure advantage or profit in favor of one or the other party. Instead, reciprocity refers to a set of relationships that are entered into through mutuality as a form of co-labor and or collaboration whereby all parties benefit through acts of trust, friendship, kindness, and sharing. The next tenet being activation is quite literally an act or activity in which or through which a process of constituent practice can have real world affects and produce change. That real world affect thing is what really intrigued me when I came across this. Um, a little bit of a backstory, I'll go a little bit off topic, or off topic, on topic, but off my presentation. Um, my whole interest or intrigue with constituency was sort of came from being in a fine arts undergrad. 
um, where I felt like, and this is something that you know I've spoken to a lot of people recently or ever since, um, it seems to be a common uh, all across that uh, we don't feel like these programs prepare us for um, being professionals in the industry beyond, I mean, not even as fine artists. Um, so that's where my interest in the arts ecology came from and these networks and what are these networks. And I was speaking to someone back in 2020 and they asked me, because you know, the term community could very easily be you know, placed in here. And they asked me, what do I think the difference between community and constituency means? And I sort of had a few minutes to think about it and came to the conclusion that um, for me, the way I understand constituency, there's like this degree of necessity attached to it where, I mean, it's, it's arguable the community is also necessary, but with a constituent, it's, it's like a, you can't function without, of it, without it. So um, yeah, anyway, real world affects and produce change. Drawing on the political and social histories of activism, forms of constituent activation, seek to transcend the symbolic representation or proposal of possible future change, and instead indicate the initiation of a process through which forms of reimagination and of thinking otherwise can be shared as tools of creation and reshaping. The next tenet that I'd like to just read is structures, which is probably my favorite tenet. Um, structures are not seen as a set of delimitations, borders, territories, or closures. Instead, structures are understood as representing the complex social and historical arrangement of relationships between parts or elements of collaborating constituencies. As such, both physical and ideological structures are seen as forms of material process that can be renegotiated through the production of constituent and common assembly as a means to decolonize the current limitations of our shared history. And then finally, negotiation, I'm nearly done, refers to a constituent right to form, shape, and continually redefine relationships of power, as well as structures of inequality through processes of active commoning. As such, negotiation is also taken to indicate the active process of reaching agreements that are, of themselves, both fluid, provisional, mutual, and constituent. Right, now that everyone has a breakdown of what that means, we can get into my first case study, which is home is where the art is. So, um, a little bit of background on the exhibition uh, was held in 2020 right after all of the strict um, lockdowns due to COVID. Uh, essentially, it was an open call to Cape Tonians to contribute artworks themselves, um, which they either made or um, inherited, had in their collection. Is there any, anyone here actually who maybe contributed to the... Okay, one person, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, so essentially, uh, the museum ended up getting nearly 2,000 artworks, which is quite incredible, um, from you know emerging artists, established artists, children, anyone and everyone, photographers, uh, sculptors, you know, you name it. Um, so yeah, what makes this exhibition constituent? It's just another very nice installation image. All images courtesy of Zeitzmacher, I might add. <laughs> uh, so. Okay, reciprocity is the first tenet which um, I'd like to discuss in relation to this exhibition. Um, specifically, the part that says um, relationships are entered into through mutuality. So in order for this exhibition to have succeeded, um, there needed to be an extreme level of trust from both parties, from Zeitzmacher's side towards the people of Cape Town as well as from Cape Townians towards Zeitzmacher. Because um, essentially it's, it comes back to that thing of necessity. The museum wouldn't have been able to put up this exhibition if the people of Cape Town didn't show up in you know, the thousands that they did. Um, so in that way, it becomes beneficial for Zaid's Mokka, um, but then it's also obviously in the benefit of the people, the contributors, or um, because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to be exhibited in an institution at the scale um, of Zaid's Mokka. Um, and the same can be said for the publication, which was produced, which featured every single artwork, um, nearly 500 pages, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so again, it's, you know, the, the people provided the content and then uh, they also, so Insights Marker's benefit, Insights Marker got to produce a publication and people had the chance to be published in that way. Um, so a reciprocal exchange can be seen here. And next, 
the idea of activation. So I've just put on the slide um, with all of these the, the quote from the Constituent Museum of what it means. Um, I'd like to highlight again that thing that I said about the real world affects that produce change. Um, so it's, these things are also all sort of linked. It comes again back to the idea of access that the museum provided to people. Um, in, you know, I'm thinking about like emerging artists uh, gaining a foot in the door by having their work up in the show. Um, so yeah, in that way it's it activated um, those networks. But I was also curious to hear what exhibitors actually thought. Um, and I came across this absolutely delightful blog. It's called, <laughs> it's called The Sharonicles, and I highly, highly recommend you read it. <laughs> Um, the woman is called Sharon War. I don't know, Sharon here, yeah, I actually don't know, <laughs> probably not, but she's incredible. Um, and she actually uh, exhibited in the show, her and her child, and she writes about, in hyper details you'll see, about the whole process of what it meant to be a contributor or participant in the show. And I'd just like to read this quote. This is in relation to dropping off the artwork, which again also for me forms part of this like idea of networks because the museum actually had different drop off points which were other partner institutions and art centers across the Western Cape if I'm not mistaken or was it, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know who Sharon is speaking about, Lee, this might be you or... <laughs> <laughs> I asked the lady if I really had to go through all this as the artwork wasn't valuable, surely I could just hand it to her and run away. She responded by saying that every, this is Sharon's uh, writing, every artwork exhibited in the Zeitz is valuable with a certain tone of judgy condemnation, as if I had just been referring to my firstborn and not a piece of cardboard that came on a 130 rand mirror. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, I thought that that was quite illuminating for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, it highlights some very obvious um, stereotypes associated with artworks um, and the exclusivity of museums and the type of art that is housed in museums being reserved for valuable artworks which is also like a whole discussion in itself we were just speaking about the art market you know what does a valuable artwork mean um, and so the seriousness with which the museum handled every artwork and she she does go into a lot of praise and detail about how professional everyone was, so it's it's quite a, um, a lovely review. Um, the seriousness then um, disrupts those assumptions that people have um, of the museum. Um, and then also uh, it becomes interesting because the museum circumvents these barriers with the public as well in, in this exhibition, because um, there is a, a very obvious barrier between the viewer and institution. Institutions are notoriously um, very, uh, what is the word? Um, what's the word I'm thinking about? Difficult to intimidating, intimidating spaces um, to enter. So this exhibition really um, went the extra mile in terms of uh, also the, the tenant of negotiation, which had a look at um, power uh, structures and things like that. Um, and then also just another quote from Sharon, uh, when we got to the floor that housed the exhibition, it was everything I believe an art museum should be. It was filled floor to ceiling with paintings, photographs, sculpture, color, and life. So quite a lovely review from Sharon. So my next case study, which I would like to speak about, is the reason we are all gathered here today, uh, the Zeitzmacher and University of the Western Cape Museum Fellowship Program. Um, so I don't feel like I need to go into much background into what the program is. I feel like we've probably discussed this at length, especially this morning, but if anyone has joined since. Um, the program essentially is in its inaugural year right now, and that's just a picture of all of us, um, with uh, partners from UWC as well as from uh, Zayt Smaka. Um, and it was an open call to anyone on the African continent, um, which provided um, work experience and exposure to fellows, as well as the academic rigor from the Center um, of Humanities Research at UWC. Uh, so we all graduated with, um, well, we haven't graduated. I actually don't know when our graduation is, but we, <laughs> we hopefully have history degrees now, honors in history. 
So what makes the program constituent, I will ask again. Uh, again, the, this idea of reciprocity. So um, Tandazani did uh, expand on this a little bit earlier, but um, for me, it comes back to that idea of um, wanting to train and educate young professionals. And this creates a circular economy. Um, so I did mention, you know, the fellows get the benefits of exposure, access, as well as work experience within an institution, um, as well as, mind you, contributing to the institution in their respective departments and fields, uh, which is quite a significant thing to be doing, at least, um, you know, as like a first sort of real job for, for a lot of us. Um, but then also the fellows then form part of this, like I was saying, circular economy where it's, it's in the benefit of the museum to be having people like us in their network um, to draw on in the future. So it really becomes a reciprocal exchange in that way. Um, and then also the next tenet that it engages for me is that of structures. Um, so in a very literal way, I wanted to briefly touch on UWC's history department here. Um, so as you can see there, you know, the idea of structures, I'll just read a little bit. Both physical and ideological structures are seen as forms of material processes that can be renegotiated through the production of constituent and common assembly as a means to decolonize the current limitations of our shared history, histories. Um, so in quite a literal way, um, doing a history degree with UWC, and not just any history degree, but one, you know, at the, one of the best programs in the country, if, if not the best, um, the whole the whole uh, degree or course was structured around um, dealing with notions of historiography and what it means to you know what is history. Um, so in that way, the these like structures and become negotiated um, you know within ac an academic context as well. Um, but it was also interesting for me how the museum sort of availed itself to be the subject of research because you run the risk of like opening yourself up to scrutiny, which I don't think any of us did uh, in the end, but it's like, um, it's quite a selfless thing to be doing as an institution. I don't think there's a lot of places that are as open to that as possible because we were very, you know, we were encouraged by UWC to just write what we want um, and to, which is wonderful. Um, but again, it's, it, it becomes a constituent form to, to be that open about things um, and about, the possibility of negotiation. So the one of the final programs I'd like to speak about is the Atelier Residency, Atelier Artist Residency Program. Um, so this was launched as a sort of experimental platform slash open studio residency for Cape Town based artists uh, on invitation. Um, so four artists have shown there now. Currently, Ekshan Adams has taken up residence since October. Um, and it's a six month, roughly, uh, residency uh, that gives viewers unprecedented exposure into the inner workings of a studio. Um, it was, I had quite a, <laughs> quite a few really funny encounters during December, because I was, um, uh, I was here when a lot of people, a lot of staff were um, taking their leave. Um, and I was sitting in the atelier in, the, in level two in that space. And the whole studio was also on break. So it was just me. And the amount of people who <laughs> came through and asked me if I'm a performance artist simulating a studio was <laughs> hilarious. There was one instance where I just, I was eating lunch there. And I just left my, I left my like plates with my fork and everything and to go to the bathroom. When I came back, there were two people standing there like, this is revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry to break it to you guys. So it was, yeah, it was quite hilarious. People, people legitimately thought that it was a simulation into what an artist studio looks like. Um, which, yeah, is quite illuminating for a number of reasons, but... Um, so that's just a picture of the current artist in residence, Ekshan Adams. Um, and so with this uh, program, I wanted to really highlight some of the relationships that become um, renegotiated or you know, highlighted in this, in this program. So firstly, it's between the artist and the viewer. 
Um, and this is arguably one of the most obscure relationships in the industry. Um, viewers rarely, rarely get the chance to engage with, you know, the artists behind the work that they are looking at, be that at an art fair and, you know, gallery exhibitions, much less an institutional show. Um, so by removing that boundary, uh, this so-called privileged relation then uh, becomes more accessible and transparent in that way. Um, and the program also s simulates uh, the intimacy of a studio visit, uh, which is a common practice in the arts industry, but one that's rarely reserved for anyone outside of those, uh, those systems and structures, such as visitors to a museum. Um, and then also the relationship between artists and museum. Um, so when dealing with the relationship between artists and institutions, uh, more, more often than not, there's uh, some type of middle person or liaise, gallery liaison, institutional liaison, what have you. Um, so with a project like the Atelier Residency, the artist, well, the artist gains insight into how institutions operate, which I think is massively valuable. Um, and the institution also gains access to the artist in like a unfiltered type of way, because uh, there's no middle person to go through. Um, and then finally, the relationship between museum, the museum and galleries. So by galleries, I mean the galleries who have representation over the artists who are showing in or showing working in the in the atelier program. Um, so in a bit of a less direct way than the previous two relationships I spoke about, the local galleries are then being linked to the museum as well and vice versa. So. Again, it's, it's, it's highlighting those networks, um, which is the whole practice of constituency. So um, I'll just ask again, uh, what makes a program constituent? So structures, uh, as I've spoken about, um, involving all players from the industry. It's um, the program is uh, contributing to renegotiating these limits or boundaries between um, these different players. Uh, and then also the idea of uh, negotiation, uh, as I defined previously as um, redefining relationships of power. So it's sort of similar in that way, in, um, uh, doing similar things that the structure tenant is doing. Um, right, and then my final uh, case study uh, is Eshan Adam Studio. So those of you who know me know I probably can't go more than five minutes without bringing up Ikhshan. Um, but I bring him up today because he's the, he's the atelier residency artist right now. Um, and yeah, so just a little bit of background on his studio right now being there. So they've moved in October. Um, and I really feel like uh, his studio practice um, embodies constituency in the most extreme sense of the term. Um, currently, there's about 20 people working in the studio, um, majority of them being, if not direct family members, people he went to school with or grew up with. Um, and so, but I'll elaborate a little bit on what makes the studio constituent. So again, the idea of reciprocity, um, I mentioned in relation to the fellowship program, the idea of a circular economy. Um, so with Ershan creating jobs constantly, um, he's empowering members of his community. Um, another uh, example of reciprocal practice, um, something he often does is he will um, look out for um, people from Bontiavo, from his community who show artistic promise, um, employ them to work on a tapestry and then the funds generated from the sale will go towards their study. Um, so he takes in temporary people like that um, and really empowers them to to um, go and study. Uh, he's also constantly working with groups of children from Bontiavo. Um, there's one particular group who he has worked with for a number of years. Because I also think it's a different thing to just be working with a group um, once as opposed to over literal number of years. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he, there was a workshop two weeks ago where they came in and um, contributed again to, um, he's currently working on uh, these uh, real dance uh, ideas. Uh, so they, they came to dance on like t-shirt material and that will be sold, turned into t-shirts and sold and then the funds will go towards the children. Um, and then Again, just the idea of structures, which I've spoken about quite a bit, but yeah, I mean, tangible structures of 
employment, development, support for his community, all of that. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, this is just a picture of the real dance that I was speaking about, which is also um, uh, a dance group from uh, Ukip. Uh, it's a family member who um, owns the dance company. So back to the sort of reciprocal thing with uh, empowering members of his community and all of that. Anyway, yeah, that's it. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions or... Okay, Siseko has a question. Can someone get a mic to Siseko, please? Hi, Monique. Hi. Thank you so much for... I like things broken down into comp parts so I can understand them fully. I think the question I have is more around effective constituency or effective constituent practice, right? Mm -hmm. What, how do you view a more effective means in which this engagement or process occurs? One in which one acknowledges the fact that they in part are uh, in part and parcel the constituent, i.e. I work at sites, but I grew up in the township Guguletu. I can't really divorce that particular context or proximity. And as such, I find myself constantly inviting people in my community to the space and making them aware of the space. Or in the examples you've given, there's a clear demarcation of, let's say, institutions from Ikhshan Adams, the human, the studio, in relation to Zeitzmoka, who part, make, part, make part of the constituent, but also sit as the institution. So is it better then to have a clear demarcation of who and who, or is it perhaps more effective in blurring those lines to create more, let's say, constant uh, interactions with each other? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's open to speculation, but I would think that, um, yeah, I, lo I, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. I've actually, I've had this conversation with Koyo um, in one of our meetings that we had where I asked her, should, for instance, as an example, commercial galleries be doing public programming? Or should they leave that to institutions and you know uh, arts, other arts organizations? Um, so, yeah, it's a tough one. I would I would advocate for everyone doing what they can. If you have you know if you have the funds, like Ekshan, for example, if we take him, you know you sell work, you have money, you have extra money, do a workshop with children. Um, so in that way, I I do think that there are blurred lines and I don't think that people need to stay in their lane because that's also how you know people develop is by blurring lines um yeah but as an institution yeah I mean it's it's there are like I feel like um financial sort of limits to what institutions can do and can offer um yeah so it's a it's a tricky question I don't think there's a clear answer to it yeah Thanks, Monique. Um, I like how very distinct your research question is, um, uh, because I think it's also very generous, um, given the time you spent in the Institutional Advancement mm -hmm. Department, which is, um, you know, this one department in the museum that is concerned with ideas of patronage, um, mm -hmm. audience development, um, and engagement. Um, and so this idea of uh, the constituent museum, I think also further complicates the question of what the role of a museum like Zeitzmacher mm -hmm. is, right? Um, and we often as um, staff members, as members of the team here, talk about this museum as being Pan-African. Mm -hmm. And our programming sort of seeks to project um, that idea um, outward beyond our immediate locale, which is Cape Town. Um, but then in other instances like the atelier, mm -hmm. it is specific to art, Cape Town-based artists. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fellowship program, as one of your case studies, calls on practitioners from all over the continent or those who have a relationship to the continent. Um, so I'm interested in how constituency, as you have thought through it, uh, uh, is confronted or contends with the kind of largely and almost um, broadly, generally, uh, um, uh, ways in which, you know, uh, uh, we think about the role of museums, 
like how do we complicate, how do yeah. you think um, the research you've done yeah. complicates what people's perception mm -hmm. is um, about what the museum ought to do as, because I've, I also have spent a little time in my own mm. work previous to working in a museum, thinking about the museum as a social mm -hmm. being, as a, yeah. you know, living in a social, like being part of the social construct and the social contract. Mm -hmm. um, so the civic contract, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, yeah so this is something we've actually um, dealt with at length in our um, UWC coursework, which was super interesting with um, Prof. Leslie Fitz. But um, in my second chapter, I actually write about the utility of museum or the usefulness of museums. Um, and it's because I was also interested in, you know, um, why are we here? What are we doing? Um, and trying to think of how the constituent museums model and those four tenets might uh, answer some of those questions. And so I came to um, research the Center for Art Education, which um, again drew on multiple players from the industry. Um, I also did case studies from the projects that they did, but um, I think the big thing there was, the, I mean, the whole thing with the constituency is about network. So it's about, um, okay, maybe I should backtrack. So I wrote about the utility, but I also wrote about um, this term in the book called architectures of utility, um, because I was curious about how um, the specific architecture um, of the museum being, you know, Thomas Heatherwick uh, designed and um, intimidating, because it is quite an intimidating, and this is something that in institutional advancement, myself and Claire have spoken about a lot, is, you know, ways that we can get people into the museum um, and break down those, those literal physical architectures. Um, and so I thought of the Center for Art Education as a particularly useful way of doing that in terms of um, like one of the case studies I can talk about is the mobile museum, which I feel like does that in a very, well, will hopefully do that, but up until now, it's still in its planning phase, um, looking to launch, I think later this year. Um, so I think it comes back to uh, transparency and access um, and networks. Uh, so I think those are the biggest things that I see as like the, the usefulness that museums um, offer, yeah. Are there, I don't know if there are any other questions, otherwise we'll, we'll end here. Storm has a question. I'm just trying to see if we, I can keep you guys here until after six. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I think um, it's maybe uh, not to, to go too personal, but I'm very, just very curious about the, you know, I kind of like recall, you know, when the offer was made for you to join, and I didn't know you from above, so I knew, I, I saw a resume, um, but that you were like kind of Storm, you, we, you spoke in the following system, what should I do? And is it worth yes. it? And, what, and I was like, yeah. I was like, of course, you should do it. But I'm just curious about the journey a little bit. And maybe uh -huh. if we have a minute for just a quick reflection about yeah. this moment of like anticipating with the program and mm -hmm. you maybe specifically now because your work has been about the institution itself, mm -hmm. you're in it and yeah. then also kind of outside of it at the same time. But just curious about the shifts that maybe has happened for you personally in the program. And maybe I want to extend mm -hmm. that question to some of the other um, yeah. fellows as well. Can you back off that and add something? Um, firstly, I wanted to say congratulations for not mentioning blank as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so very funny. <laughs> taking that opportunity to be personal as well. But um, I want to be honest, um, during your presentation, I think it's okay. Can you hear me? Okay. During your presentation, I almost cried um, because of what Tato is saying. Um, I think your research is so generous and also has taken the time to humanize mm -hmm. um, this museum, which really has the reputation of being cold and inaccessible exactly. and very yeah. far detached from mm -hmm. people and that social work that museums are supposed to do. And so thank you also for looking backwards. You know, all our, our presentations were very much focused on the present mm -hmm. exhibitions, but you took the time to look at home as where the art is. And I think that's so, it's such a beautiful way to, to express our gratitude um, mm -hmm. as the first cohort to this kind of museum fellowship program. Um, so 
Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Madame Kula. That's very sweet of you. Um, I'll just quickly, I'll quickly answer Storm's question, um, and that might lead us into our thank yous for the day as well. Um, but about that, like, you know, disdain reputation you're talking about, like, I, I also had that, um, and that is why I was very hesitant to sign on, especially being an inaugural program, because um, I was, I sort of had quite an established type of um, position at the place I was at before I won't mention the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was it was a tough decision for me to to leave, and one that everyone knows I've grappled with extensively. But um, uh, what this program has taught me, because uh, I I was curious about the space, um, and I'm the only fellow who's Cape Tonian, and so I know what the people in the arts world of Cape Town are saying about the institution. Um, so I was curious about it for different reasons. Um, and I've also been curious about the institutional space because of like its ability to um, be public facing and to you know um, be more educational and uh, you know contribute to public programming, all of that, um, which the commercial galleries don't do um, really at all. Um, so, being an institutional advancement, um, which I ended up choosing, we all had the opportunity to sort of motivate which department we wanted to work in. Um, I mean, it taught me the ins and outs of what it takes to run an institution and what it takes to turn, you know, to keep the lights on, which is something that I also speak about in the in the zine, um, that part of my research. But um, I mean, it's it's in. I was I was also speaking to Jean Marie about this the other day about how this program is sort of. Um, it's a way to really get a sense of what institutions are and what it takes to work in a museum, but without the sort of, um, what is the word I'm thinking about? Like um, commitment to, you know, committing to working in an institution. Um, so it, it really gives you a nice like dip your toe in the water type of thing. I mean, for myself, I've come to um, realize that it isn't necessarily the space I want to work in, um, but, you know, going from here, towards my next role, it's the space that I'm going to be working with, which I think is something that I wasn't able to do before. Um, and I've come to realize, you know, in, in transitioning um, out of the program into other jobs that it's something that's quite in demand, is people working on the commercial side of things who have a knowledge of institutions, because often I think people go from commercial to institution, but they don't often go back. Um, so in that way, it's been incredibly useful. Um, for me to yeah do that. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. Maybe I should go next um, because I'm essentially signing on to two more years of fellowship. <laughs> um, I'm staying at the museum. I'm staying studying at UWC. So um, it's been a real hit for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think in contrast to Monique, I was. Uh, excited about this opportunity from the first moment that I heard about it. I had been previously studying in the US, in Chicago, and thinking about African history a lot, and actually specifically South African history and visuality a lot. And so I sort of knew at that time, this is uh, late 2021, that I needed to, if I wanted to continue the work that I was doing, I actually needed to go to the place where it was happening type of thing. And so to me, I think from afar, having never visited the museum, having only been in Cape Town on like a family vacation scenario, uh, Zaidsmoka like held a lot of uh, promise and potential and all these types of things, especially because I knew that museums are where I want to be and then sort of in the that space between art and academia and knowledge production and all that type of thing. Um, so yeah, the fellowship I think has been hugely beneficial for me. I've learned so much, I've seen how an institution, not only at this scale, but in this very specific and quite unique context operates. Um, and I think one thing that I've really taken away from this year is, as Monique was mentioning, uh, we had a chance to motivate for the department that we wanted to work in. And I will say amongst all fellows, there was not too much enthusiasm to work in the registrar's department, <laughs> um, which I think at the time we kind of thought that it was boring, admin, desk work, just like nitty gritty, dotting your I's and crossing your T's type of work. And uh, there was this moment, the day that the uh, 
permanent placements were announced, I was zooming into the meeting, sick at home with COVID. And when I was asked how I felt about it, um, it was, my voice sounded really sick is what I'm sticking with. Um, so I didn't sound like super excited is basically the thing. And on my first day back in the office, like I sat down with Lee and she explained to me why she motivated for me to join that department and sort of the potential that she saw there. And that's been totally realized. Like um, I couldn't see this year working in a different department. Honestly, it's been, every day has been such a pleasure, not only like working with Lee and my colleague Rishka and Michelle and Inez and Pums and I can go and go. Um, but yeah, just sort of, and I think this is maybe one of the central ideas of the fellowship is um, yes, it's kind of a dip in the toe, a dip, dipping your toe in the water, but also from day one, we were all given quite a lot of responsibility and quite a lot of agency. There wasn't a whole lot of hand holding. Um, and so at times, maybe that was challenging, but I think most of all, it was really educational, really insightful. I was able to take on projects. I was able to use my own perspective, my own knowledge to contribute to the department. And then it was reciprocated back to me. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been really, really fantastic. I've also fallen in love with the CHR at UWC, who I was talking to Seth earlier. They are a history department, and I think they're extremely generous with what history means. They allow people to go on crazy tangents thinking about Xerox machines and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, that's a, a brief and grateful rundown. And now to one of my colleagues. <laughs> Um, Storm, because I spoke immediately after you, I'm going to have to ask you to just repeat <laughs> the exact question so I can respond directly. Uh, no, it was just um, what a personal reflection on what the year meant um, for you. Um, I think I expressed... No, it's okay. Um, what, so what uh, I found particularly um, touching about what Monique said is that um, I think initially we didn't realize how much trust the museum um, put in us. So we, we thought we were trusting them with our careers, but they, they put a lot of trust in us. And, um, and you're right about that circular economy. There were so many things that we could have revealed about the institution, you know, because it wasn't smooth sailing. There were so many times when a lot of us wanted to give up. We were so frustrated because considering the pressure of time and the time constraints, everyone is dealing with such tough deadlines, such impossible deadlines. And so um, to just see how ultimately all our research projects were about how, how magnificent this place was, how incredible this place was, I think is really telling of the relationship that was actually there that wasn't very obvious in the beginning. For me, I can only describe it as complete gratitude. And that's what I'm going to take away from this um, fellowship program is it took time to realize it. Um, for me personally, I think I'm someone who needs to get in touch with the people that I work with. And because of the time constraints and the pressures that we deal with here, like this environment, is not fit for the kind of um, passion that I bring. Um, <laughs> because I'm highly emotional about everything, you know, and sometimes it's hard for me to see things just at face value. Like, okay, this is, a t is, a, is, is an issue of time, or this is an issue of um, being short staffed, or an issue of like resource. And so uh, for me, state museums are the best place to, to, to bring my full self. Um, because it's clear, you know, that like this is we're doing this for the people, and 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 the results are so so much more immediate, you know. But what I'm going to take away from this place is that it, in its own way, it is about society and it is about the people, and um, it just functions in a different sort of pressure cooker. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, Zeitz really has changed, you know, the trajectory of my career. Um, and um, I'll forever be grateful for this experience. Yeah. Mm. I guess that leaves me. Um, well, 
It's been a long year, but I will say the immediate thing that I'm grateful for is that now I don't have to say that I have a software engineering degree. Like, now I have a history degree, so <laughs> that's in the past. I don't know who software engineering is. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so that is the immediate thing that I'm grateful for. Um, but... I'm so grateful for how my thinking about things has evolved over the course of this year, being in fellowship with the other fellows uh, and being in continuous conversation with Rory Besta, with uh, the History Honours cohort. Um, I think initially, um, as soon as I joined the program, there's, I've, I've been interested in blackness and uh, when I'm thinking about black artists, when I'm thinking about black writers, I think I've been very invested in, um, I guess their social and political context and I still am, but I think I've witnessed an evolution in uh, my research interests in that I guess now I'm more interested in their practice uh, and in the forms that they use and in the styles and in the aesthetics. And I think that's something I'm really grateful for because uh, as a writer, I think I want to see more people writing about black artists in that way that does not just uh, focus on their cultural and political context. So I'm so grateful to have like witnessed that evolution in myself in the way that I think and I see um, art. Um, and I'm also grateful to have been placed in the Center for Art Education where having a chat with Lizzo yesterday. And I think the most challenging thing about being in the art education department was that I'm not a trained teacher, so I don't know how to teach, but I do think uh, that is something that I've been able to learn uh, while in the art education department because I've been facilitating the Mocha Art Club, uh, which was over the course of like six months. Uh, and it's been a really interesting experience. And as someone who is very interested in still being in academia in still teaching and still you know being in that space i think it has been really foundational in that sense so i'm so grateful for that and also just general for the generosity of everyone but especially uh the people that i have been in fellowship with uh in talking about ideas in caring for each other in holding space for each other um i think that has been so important to me and i'm so grateful to like have had a, a relationship with each of the fellows uh and to have learned so much from all of you and to have like witnessed uh your brilliance and to also have seen how all of your research ideas and interests and you know the things that you know you are interested in uh, materializing in different ways so that has been such an amazing and beautiful experience um i'm generally feeling i'm feeling grateful and i've changed so much as a person i think from the person that i was when i joined in february i think i'm a different person i mean not completely but <laughs> uh I can, I can tell how I have changed and I appreciate the change that I see in myself. And yeah, it's been amazing. It's been great. So now in this moment of gratitude, um, we just have a few thank yous. Um, from my part, I would just like to thank each and every colleague at the museum across all departments, uh, ranging retail, front of house, security, cleaning, all sort of five core departments, curatorial registrar, exhibitions management, institutional advancement, and art education. I would like to name everyone by name, but then there's always someone who slips out. But uh, fortunately, these are people who have really been so supportive, so kind uh, with us as fellows every day at the museum, you know, they welcomed five randos 
in in February, and um, it's it's been really good to work with such a wonderful and very diverse group of people with a wide range of interests and passions. And uh, it's been it's been a very great experience working here at the museum. So, thank you to all colleagues, and a special thank you uh, to Tato as well as the IA team. Uh, with Esther and Anissa and Misha, who's not here right now, and to the audio team for really uh, getting us together to bring this symposium into reality. A few months ago, we said, oh, it would be so nice to do some kind of capstone event, something like that. Um, and it materialized um, thanks to a real collective effort. So thank you to everybody at Zeitsmoka. And thank you everyone who has attended today. Um, I also want to thank UWC and the Center for Humanities Research, and specifically to Prof. Besta for holding this fellowship on both sides. And uh, I will not mention everyone's name, but all of our lecturers and supervisors and people that we have been learning from and learning with, and also to our sponsors, Africa No Filter and Aqua Foundation. We are grateful. And finally, and most importantly, we'd like to thank ourselves. <laughs> um, so thank you to Ange Frederick Coffey, to Mirembe, to Monique Duplessis, to Motlalipola Pukubje, to Rory Kahia Sapai for doing the things, for showing up. Well done. <laughs> If you haven't yet gotten a zine, I'll be handing them out by the door. <laughs>